Hello and welcome to The Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I am Mark Stone. A big thank you, as always, to the people who keep this podcast going. And that is our academies in the Bestseller Academy. It is our patrons over on Patreon. And it's to you, our dear listeners. Welcome one and all to this week's show. Mr. D, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mr. Stay. How's things going at your end? I saw an interesting post about a certain blurb. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, second second book in the Witch of Woodville series. Uh, got an email from my editor with a blurb that she put together, uh, and then having just done an episode with Matthew Ralph about blurbs and marketing and that sort of thing, I, I kind of went in there and thought, right, excellent, let's have a go at this. So uh, yeah, been uh, chopping that up into little pieces and then molding it back into shape and and selling the sizzle. So yeah, it's uh, that's been fun. Now, what uh, is that usual for an editor to to kind of have a first stab at a blurb and yeah, do it combined yeah. with the author, or does does the publisher usually say this is the blurb? You know, if there's anything you really don't like about it, let us know. Or how, does it just vary depending on the the publisher in, and the editor? In my experience, uh, the the publishers have had a go and then sent it to me for approval, and then I've gone in and, and made my own changes and comments. And when I say blurb, this isn't like a one-liner or one paragraph. This is the copy that goes on the back of the paperback. Of the so book, it's yeah. it's like three paragraphs long. So it's it's still got to be sizzly, still got to grab you, still got to hook you in. It's that you know that that thing where the punter picks up the paperback, turns it over, looks on the back, or oh, it's that description. There you go. There's our well, back to reality. I, well, yep, this is it. I just literally <laughs> reached out for people not watching this on video, just reached out for the back to reality book that I, my trusty companion that sits beside me here when we do the podcast. This was the blurb that we wrote um, mm. on the back of the book. Um, a story of second chances that's impossible to put down. Actually, that was, that was a kind of more of a top line, isn't it? Then we had some quotes everything the world loves about British comedy. Uh, and like if Nick Hornby wrote a time travel book, Swap Adventure. And then there was, the, I mean, literally, how many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six individual lines. Um, and it just goes, and it's, I remember doing it. It's so hard for us to write this because you've worked on a book for, well, in our case, a year. You've, you've edited it the thousands of words you've lost mm. chapters you've cut things out and then you have to stick something on the back which will if somebody picks up they'll make a decision to buy the book based on what you write i mean it's kind of insane in some ways isn't it yeah it's really reductive and 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 very hard but you've got to sell the sizzle you've got to sell you the do. sizzle and yeah. um at, after today's interview i've got a little treat for listeners to show how book marketing has not changed really over yeah. the years the principles are the same so we'll, we'll come back to that <laughs> now one of the things one of the things that we did learn through this process and i know you've done it a number of times since as well this idea of writing a blurb and the importance of it we've actually generated an entire course on just writing what we call a beta blurb or a beta blurb depending on which part of the world you're from and that's one of the things you do really early on in in the academy um, course roadmap because we think it's really important to have a stab at something early on just to kind of formulate your concepts the elevator pitch in some ways of you know if you, if you met someone in the elevator and you had one minute to tell them what your book was about you'd kind of work through a general idea and it was kind of pithy and and to the point and then the whole point of the actual beta blurb is over the course of writing the book you you go back to it and you say no nah, this doesn't really represent where i'm at right now especially if you're a, a you know a, a pantser and you've just been writing stuff and these incredible things have happened and you think no actually these characters are coming and you start to kind of hone it so you don't get to the end of the book and think oh my gosh how on earth am I going to write it? You've already started mm. to think about what your blurb is likely to look like, and it helps you kind of guide your writing, doesn't it? At the very least, giving yourself some kind of log line or shout line that also can act as a central dramatic argument, as a thematic argument. Funnily enough, I've just been, um, I seem to spend the last week or so just writing pitches, and one of them <laughs> was for a TV show that I'm, I'm going to be putting out there. And I've got to do pithy, blurbs, you know, pitches for episodes, six episodes of this TV show. But I started each one with a question, which is that thematic, central, dramatic argument, you know, that the idea, mm -hmm. in other words, what is this episode about? So uh, it's, it's one of those things that actually really 
puts a flag in the ground and says, okay, this is what you're going to be writing about for 30 minutes, you know, for, for this, for this particular show. And I found, I found it really, really helpful, really, really mm, helpful. Mm. And, um, it's, I mean, you may discover that in, as you write, as the story evolves, that you may go off in this direction or that direction, but to get you started, I find just, just knowing what it's about and, and, and positioning that as a, as a question, as, as an argument. Uh, is really, really helpful. I just had a meeting today um, with a director and we're hopefully going to be writing on something. And the first thing we figured out was our theme. Mm. And we both know then that we're at least kind of singing from the same hymn book, which is so useful. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really fascinating as well when you think about the process. We often think so much about the process of writing from the writer's perspective, which is obviously naturally where we come from when writing books. But actually I've been starting to think quite deeply about the book from the reader's perspective. And mm. I've developed this model called the reader's investment funnel. And the blurb, yeah, I know, I've still been working on the back and I'm gonna be coaching on this in the academy soon because uh, the blurb actually pays, uh, it plays a very important part of the process. Um, in terms of actually getting the reader to invest in reading your book is this idea that there are several stages, quite a few stages actually that a reader goes through. And it's not just about writing the book, although obviously that's the most essential thing because if you get them to page one and page one's no good, then you've lost them at that point. But the stuff that happens before you get them to page one, absolutely crucial. And so that's why we put so much emphasis in the academy of getting the idea of the blurb you know, starting the process of thinking about the blurb up front, because you have to actually, you ha it's a process of getting good. Being a good writer doesn't make you a good blurb writer necessarily, no. because they're two very different things, aren't they? Totally. But yeah. anyway, we won't go into detail. That's all in the course in the Academy. If that kind of stuff interests you, and Mark wanted to just jump in and say something. I'm just, just, just going to say, do you want to, do you want to hear my blurb? Yeah, I'd love to. Absolutely. Go for quite it. Nervous. As, this, as, quite... as in version what? This is like, this is what's going out there. This so is you, this is approved now. This is yeah, like the one. Yeah. Oh, wow. So if 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 anyone listens to this and goes, I don't like that. I'm kind of stuffed. So I'm kind of <laughs> should have done this two <laughs> weeks ago. Yeah. We could have had a cr crowdsourced. <laughs> All right. Okay, Mr. Stay talking about the blurb <clears throat> in Babes in the Wood. July, 1940. Magic, mystery, murder. In a quiet village in rural Kent. A magical mystery leads to murder. Woodville has returned to normal after the departure of the Crowfolk. The villagers put out fires from aircraft shot down in the Battle of Britain, and Faye Bright discovers that magic can be just as dangerous as any weapon. The arrival of a trio of Jewish children fleeing the Nazis brings the fight for Europe to the village. When their guardian is found dead, Faye must play nanny to the terrified children while gathering clues to uncover a dark magic that threatens to change the course of the war. And she must do it quickly. The children have seen too much, and someone wants them silenced for good. <gasps> available to pre-order now! <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Stay is available for book blurb reading sessions on the podcast. Uh, please contact us at... That's brilliant, Mark. Great, great, great radio voice there as well. That's Thank really good. Much. Totally yes. sucked me in. Very good, good, interesting. Good, good. And and interesting, you kind of referenced the previous book in it, which I liked. Mm. That was the uh, editor. The editor did that. I wouldn't really? have done that. Yeah, yeah she I was going to say, yeah, that was, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. But I think, uh, um, but yeah, it sounds just, like the- Just to make one. it clear, there's some repetition there. The July 1940 Magic Mystery Murder, that goes on the front cover. And then it's ah, repeated on the back. Ma a magical it. mystery leads to murder. Just in case anyone's thinking, you've repeated yourself. So that's that's why that's there. Yeah. yeah. But also it, it it has a kind of stylistic similarity to the first book as well. Was that yeah, on yeah, purpose, yeah. right? Absolutely, definitely. So that's the kind of way you tie the series together. So very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And, well, it's also important as well. Blurbs are... The blurbs are the way that you you sell your book, and you know you, it's it's the way you hook people in ultimately. So you've got to write a good one, um, and that definitely has me salivating, Mr. Stay. Can't wait to, <laughs> yeah. And what when's the book due? When's the book due out again? It's the I think it's the twenty seventh of October. It's just before Halloween. 
how the uh, last one. So yes, yeah. it's uh, plenty of time, plenty of time to pre-order. If you're in the UK, you know all the usual places. If you're overseas, I do recommend trying the book depository because they do free worldwide. I, I swear packing. I get most of my book. Not that they're we're great. giving them a major plug or anything, but I must say, living out in Canada, I use them in the UK. They're owned by Amazon, aren't they? They are, yeah. They own yeah. by Amazon. We've got them. People are like, what? No, I was going to them because I didn't want to buy from them. Well, I'm sorry, folks. They're owned by Amazon. Um, yeah. But no, I, I must say they are good. It does take a while sometimes for a book to arrive over here. You yeah, well, the way, know, don't the way, buy something as a present if you're expecting it to arrive three days no, later. No. I give it a couple of weeks. The way the book depository are brilliant because I, I – I used to look after them when, not long after they started. And the way they work is they're not, it's not like Amazon where they've got a big warehouse somewhere. Mm. They work as a network. They work as a broker. So they will say, they will find bookshops and warehouses all over the world and say, hey, there's some, if you're in Brisbane, Australia, they'll go, Brisbane, hey, Brisbane, um, there's someone in your area that wants this book. And that mm. person will go, great, excellent. Well, we'll ship it to them, you know, and they'll do it in the book depository packaging and everything. It's kind blah, of, blah, blah. Kind it's of genius, really clever, isn't it? To really, really, to deal really, with stock. Really, no, yeah. As someone uh, who, as someone who uh, would, would run their own record label and, and book publishers, that kind of, that thought of not having all those boxes in the garage, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. very appealing. Very, very much so. Excellent stuff. Uh, but if you, if you are in the UK, uh, another plug, Cole's Books in Bista, uh, you'll get a signed copy and a free badge, exclusive free, a Woodville oh Village gosh. badge. Just check my social media for all the links. I've got them all there. So Excellent stuff. Brilliant. Plug over. <laughs> so, yeah, plug done, folks. Um, but you know what? Talking about, um, you know, the process that we go through, there's that whole other aspect that we haven't really delved much into in the last five years. Again, I say this, it amazes me that the amount of things we still have to cover on the podcast, <laughs> but psychology and human psychology. And we talk about like, you know, the psychology of like the blurb and how that brings the reader in. But today's guest, we go deep, deep into human psychology and how you can use it as a writer. So Mark, tell us um, about the incredible Mick Finley that you uh, chatted with this week. Mick Finley is the author of the Arrowwood series of historical crime fiction novels set in the in London in the 1890s. They feature an emotional agent, William Arrowwood, who is very much the antithesis of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Mick was born in Glasgow. He teaches psychology. He once ran a market stall in Portobello Road, and he's done other things. He's worked as uh, worked with the travelling circus. He's been a butcher's boy and all sorts. He's got a new book out, the fourth in the Arrowwood series, Arrowwood and the Meeting House Murders. And we discuss tips for historical research, how studying psychology can help you as a writer, and what working on a market stall in the Portobello Road taught him about human nature. Brilliant. Let's dive in and listen to Mark chatting with Mick Finley. Mick Finley, welcome to the Bestseller Experiment. How are you today, sir? I'm great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for inviting me on. It's our absolute pleasure. And we're here to celebrate the publication of the fourth in the Arrowwood books, uh, The Arrowwood and the Meeting House Murders. And what absolutely fascinated me about this, because what you, you do, I love this, when authors put a little bit of historical research to put it in context in the back of the book, and I love this stuff. And this is based on a, largely on a true incident, really. You, you, you talk about there are five men from Natal in Africa who appeared in Westminster Police Court in 1879. They're arrested for refusing to appear at the London Aquarium for, the, for a showman called Mr. Farini, who was keeping them prisoner and refusing to allow them out in case it affected the ticket prices. How do you find a story like that? That's extraordinary. It is an extraordinary story. I found it. I, I read a lot of Victorian newspapers, <laughs> and I found this one in the Illustrated Police News from 1879. Um, and immediately, I thought, I, I've got to use this. I mean, I, the the book sort of launches, takes that as a starting point, and launches off into a sort of a journey through Victorian freak shows and ethnic exhibitions and so on. And, in London, but but I knew as soon as I, I read that, well, this uh, this opens up so many issues that we can sort of explore in in the novel. Um, so yeah, I was you know I was shocked, but also you know delight as a writer, pleased to find a, a story like that to to start with. Yes, because the Victorian age was an age of exploitation, wasn't it? It wasn't all the greatest showmen singing songs, singing about this is me. It was quite different, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the, the early Victorian era, um, fairgrounds, travelling fairs had these, what they called freak shows. 
um, but also they would they would also um, have ex exhibitions of people, non-white people, people from the colonies, um, who were you know be because England was was a much much less cultural, multicultural place then. Um, people had often never seen a black person before, particularly in the rural areas. Um, so these drew large crowds, and they were very exploitative. Um, there were terrible conditions for the people, and we don't know a huge amount about those people. Um, there has been a few great books re re recently written about freak shows, Victorian freak shows, but it, uh, there was a point at which these shows moved out of the fairgrounds and, and moved into theatres, where they attracted a bigger audience, there were higher ticket prices, um, and, and some of those freak shows, the, um, the, the performers were paid a bit more. Uh, some, some of those performers even began to manage themselves and put on shows for themselves. There's a great book called The Wonders, which um, if you're inter if anybody's interested in, um, it gives you a great sort of picture of, very detailed picture of a small number of freak show performers and how, how they prospered um, when they were in the theatres. But the situation was much more difficult for um, uh, black people and people who were who came over to perform in these ethnic exhibitions or human zoos as they were often they were also called. So yeah, these these five men from Zulu men from Natal were in a terrible bind because they they'd they'd actually signed a contract in Natal with a French showman who brought them to Paris to perform in some shows there. But this showman in Paris had sold their contract to Mr. Farini who put on shows in London and he brought them to London and virtually kept them prisoner because um, he, he didn't want, as you say, the ticket prices to be affected. And they managed to escape this house they were being held in and went to a police court um, to complain. Um, and they, in the police court, they also revealed that they hadn't agreed to the, their contract being sold. So they objected to being, as they called it, sold like cattle between white men. Um, the other difficulty for them is that only one of the five could speak English, and his English was really not very good. So the only way they could communicate in the court was through a translator. But this 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 situation meant that they were stuck in London, being exploited. And even if they were to ex escape, what could they do? They didn't know anyone there. They didn't have any money. They couldn't speak English. So they were in a real bind. Let's talk about... Arrowwood, who is a fantastic creation. Uh, and he describes himself as an emotional agent, not a deductive agent. Uh, and it seems to me that he comes across as the antithesis of Sherlock Holmes. He's emotional, he's flawed, suffers with gout. Was that was that part of your intent when creating him? It was, yeah. I mean, I had the idea for Arrowwood when I was reading Sherlock Holmes stories, because I wondered what, what other private detectives in London would have felt about Sherlock had Sherlock been real. Because Sherlock was very boastful. He, he said he's the only consulting detective in the world and he certainly thought he was the best and London society clearly thought he was the best because um, he, he, he was in the newspapers. He was paid by the rich and famous for his cases. So I imagined this other detective and because I knew he would be working in Sherlock Holmes' London, because I wanted him to despise Sherlock Holmes and be very <laughs> jealous of him, I had to give him a way of solving crimes which was different to Sherlock. So that's when I decided, well, he had to be interested in psychology because Sherlock Holmes famously said that emotions interfered with solving crimes. So, so Arrowwood is very much a, an early psychologist. He uses Victorian ideas of human psychology to try and solve his crimes. And physically, as a specimen, he is the absolute opposite, <laughs> completely unathletic, unhealthy, over-emotional, and uh, surrounded by a big, he's surrounded by people. He's got, his house is overcrowded. Um, so he's not like, he's not aloof. He can't afford to be separate from, from other people as Sherlock can be. Well, this is it. You, you see a whole other side of London. Uh, the shout line for your series, which I love, is London society takes their problems to Sherlock Holmes. Everyone else goes to Arrowwood. Uh, I think you're seeing a, a side of London that you don't often see in those novels. Or if it is, it's kind of romanticised in the, the, the Baker Street regulars or whatever. Whereas, you know, this was a time of terrible poverty, wasn't it? It was. I, I was trying to imagine when I was writing the first book what what I would notice had I been translate, trans, sort of dumped in Victorian London as a twenty first century 
person. And, and I was, for me, it would be the smell of the place, the, the visible, awful poverty of, of London, um, the, the foods, the foods that I, you would eat, um, but also a whole range of physical complaints. Because you know, I, 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 as I'm sure many people of my age do, rely on things like ibuprofen, and, um, <laughs> medicine Gaviscon for my indigestion, hydrocortisone cream for my rashes, and you know all sorts of stuff which they didn't have. So there would be people wandering around with all sorts of you know. Uh, problems pains and and rashes and itches and you know arms dropping off and but for me that was what london would be like and so that that was the london i wanted to put in my novels that's, that's just made me think of a billy connolly thing where he said that when he was he started out as a welder in the docks he said yeah. the docks were full of people with limbs missing and horrible rashes and everything because you know even post war england when you had the nhs that there still weren't the medicines and, and and things that that helped us then but now we do take really do take this stuff for granted don't we yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah, even so, the, yeah, definitely the fifties and sixties. They just didn't have half of what we have nowadays. Now you mentioned psychology there, and I know you've studied and, and you teach psychology. Which uh, I remember talking to my daughter when um, she was choosing her A levels a few years ago, and I said to her, "You know, if you want to be a writer, look at psychology at how the mind works." Which um, must uh, must be. I think you. I mean, you're, you're obviously biased because you're going to agree with this. But that <laughs> must be a key to unlocking human behaviour when when looking at characters and writing, mustn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I I am fascinated with psychology, and I teach it, and I've I've done I do research in it. Um, and this and there's so many different areas of psychology which I think are useful to a writer. And I think, for example, crime writers tend to focus on forensic psychology, but actually. There's whole areas of personality psychology. I mean, I'm really interested in things, and I've become interested for a book I'm reading, writing at the moment about narcissism and, and um, psychological manipulation, for example. Um, very topical. Very <laughs> highly topical, absolutely. I mean, you think about Trump and people can rise to great positions of power having these terrible psychological flaws. Um so yeah, it's really it's really interesting to me. I mean, actually, in my in the Arrowwood books, he does use Victorian psychology, which I didn't know very much about. But I've you know I, I I had to read a bit about it. And Darwin, for example, I didn't know Darwin wrote a book about psychology, and he he wrote a book about emotions, which which Arrowwood uses. There was another really interesting person called Gustave Le Bon who wrote a book about the psychology of crowds. And he believed that emotions were transmitted through magnetism from one person to another in crowds. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought, well, that was a great idea. If Arrowwood actually believes that, then that means that he believes he can pick up emotions from other people through some form of magnetism. And so he often thinks that he's, but actually what he's doing, I mean, not, not knowing, you know, what we know nowadays, what he's doing is picking up facial cues and very sort of micro signals from people. but He's picking it up unconsciously, but he's quite good at picking it up. Um, and that's how he's de deducting um, emotions, not through magnetism. <laughs> yeah, psychology, knowing about psychology is great. I mean, there's, there's so many areas as well of psychology. I'm a social psychologist and I study group violence, racism, and um, mass killings, genocide, and things like this. And that, again, is full. You know, why do people become terrorists? You know, that, 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 that sort of question really helps with writing. Um, my first book was about Fenian terrorism. Um, and so I had a few characters who were involved in the bomb, the bombings of London, which was ha were happening in the, in the late 19th century. Um, and I wanted to give, I didn't want them to be a stereotype of a terrorist. I wanted them to, to be a sort of rich characters. And knowing some of the, you know, how people get drawn into terrorism and what they think, what they see of the, the world what the world represents to them was really useful to develop those characters as well. I'd like to ask what you think helped more with your writing, studying and teaching psychology, or having a market store on the Portobello Road, because you see all life there as well, don't you? Tell us about your time there. Yeah, I spent about five years selling T-shirts on the Portobello Road. Um, and I, I I had done lots of jobs up until that point in, in, in different 
um, fields, you know, in shops and in hotels and things like this and in bars. But I'd never done a, a job like this. And I'd never seen one. The one th thing that I learned more than anything else was the value of money, you know, because it was all cash. It was all coming straight to me. I was paying out for my goods and I was taking the money in, you know, and, and people would barter for me. And I was, I was making five pounds per t-shirt. That was my profit. Um, but the stall cost me 30 quid a day. Um, and a lot of people wanted to barter. So, you know, I spent the whole day thinking about a pound here, a pound there, you know, and every t-shirt they came in, they'd say, oh, I'll give you, no, I'll give you 12 for it. And I'd say, well, no, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do you 14. And I, all the time it was, it was money, money, money. And I, you know, I'd never thought about money. I just thought when I'd worked before, you work and then you get your pay packet. But for, you know, for, this, for this job, every, every minute of it was about cash. And so I saw money in a different way. And, I, and, you know, I guess that made me think. And when I had a bad day, I felt awful, you know, because I brought in no money. I, I, did, I also did do a Greenwich market on Sundays. And I had some terrible days there where I earned seven pounds for eight hours of work or something like this. So I, I could sort of understand then a little bit about scratching for money. And, you know, that, that, that really features in the Arrowhead novels is people are really scratching around for money. And, and you know, even, even a shilling here and there made a big difference to them. So, so that was helpful. But also, of course, there is a lot of crime on Portobello Market. There certainly was when I was doing it, which was the, the um, early 90s. There were gangs of pickpockets who went around. And, you know, I, I knew I could recognise some of them. Um, sometimes I saw them doing it, you know, and you'd have to shout out. Um, and they'd quickly pull their hands out in from the, back, the, the shoulder bag that they were going into or something. I had... Um, people who'd stolen checkbooks, buying T-shirts from me. Um, some of them I was able to detect. Some of them, of course, I wasn't. Um, and I lost those, the money for that T-shirt. Um, the, the, one of them I did detect. There was, there was two women and a man, a man. They came to the store and they were picking up T-shirts and admiring them. And, you know, and they were saying, oh, we could get one of these for so-and-so. And, yeah, oh, and it's so-and-so's birthday. And they ended up with this big pile of T-shirts. Um, and then the guy came and he stood right behind me on my shoulder in a quite intimidating way. And one of the women pulled out a checkbook and started signing her name. And I noticed her hand was shaking. Um, this, this was, of course, so long before the days of e to tapping your card or anything. Yeah. Her hand was shaking. And as I always did, I said, OK, can I see your bank card to check the signature? And it looked a bit like the signature on the bank card, but I was really, I thought, well, there's a big pile of T-shirts here. Mm. And her hand was shaking. So I said, I don't think that's your signature. And they got furious with me. The guy started shouting at me right in my ear. And then the, the, the point at which I knew I was right about them was that at one point he said, you've wasted one of our checks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <What a> giveaway. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, okay, thanks. That's stolen. Uh, and another time I was I was I also for a few months I was targeted by a gang of just plain thieves. Um and they would wait until there were a lot of people around my stall and they would I had I had t-shirts hanging up and I had racks, but I also had them laid out on the table. And they would just they put a bag under my table and then they'd distract me and they would just sort of scoop out a whole row of t-shirts into their bag and their accomplice would just walk away as they were still talking to me about trying to find a small size or something like this. And I never knew he was doing it, you know, and it went on for months and it, it, it really, I was getting really demoralized because it was a lot of my, my money for the day we were being, we were being stolen every week. And then it just stopped happening. And then about six months later, I was, standing outside my stall, leaning against the wall opposite, watching my stall. There was nobody buying. And this huge guy came up and stood beside me. And he, and he looked down at me and he looked at my stall and he shook his head and he said, you know, we never used to get much from your T-shirts. Oh. And, and it turned out he'd been inside for the last six months. Um, and I don't know why he came up to tell me that he and his, and he explained to me how they did it and everything. And, and then he just shook my hand and strolled down the road. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I learned, I learned a lot from that market store, definitely. Yeah. <laughs>
Fantastic. Oh, such a great story. Uh, we're obsessed here with writing habits, and we like to ask our guests what their where writing habits are. Are you a write every day person? I mean, I see it's again looking at the historical notes here, you're doing, you're doing a lot of reading as well. Um, so I'd be interested to know about your research methods too. But what's your what's your writing method, Mick? Well, I work in the university three days a week. So that leaves me um, two weekdays and bits of the weekend to write. So on my writing days, I the, the, the I write in the morning. Um, and then I have, after lunch, I'm just too, I can't think properly. I feel too tired. So I, I tend to go out. I walk the dog. I go on the I live in Hove and I go up on the hills and I go, um, I go and swim in the sea or something just to refresh myself and by about four o'clock my brain is back in gear again so I don't write all through the day I can't write after lunch really um but yeah so then I write for another hour or two uh, later on um if I'm editing that I can do much more solidly mm -hmm. um so I'll I might do an hours of editing and I, I do I edit like mad so by the time I submit my book to my edit, my e editor, I will probably have gone through eight versions or something. Right. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a um, pedantic and <laughs> obsessive editor. I, I really feel that my first draft, my second draft is nowhere near good enough. Even on my eighth draft, when I read back, I think, oh, God. I thought, you know, how did I miss all this stuff? How did I miss it? So I, you know, I, I editing I, I sort of do all through the week. So I'll do that as well on, you know, on trains going up to work, um, you know, it, it, at lunchtime when I get home from work, I'll, I'll edit, edit, edit. But I tend to, and nowadays I try and save my writing for um, days which are completely free of my other job. It's quite difficult. I find that when I mix up a day with work, work and writing work, then my brain is just full of niggles from my work work. Um, it's not loose enough. Yeah. I guess yeah. you've got to, the brain has to be a certain degree of looseness, I think, to write well. That's when the, the words come out properly. And you've got to find, to find the routine that, that allows your brain to be, well, find out when you're loose and, and what you can do to make it your brain loose enough to write it. Good. I like that. I like that very much. And in terms of research, you said you know, this was inspired by an article in a Victorian newspaper. How are you accessing that kind of material? Is it all online or are you going to libraries? Yeah, the British Library has the newspaper archive, which has newspapers, newspapers going back hundreds of years. Now, it's free if you go to the library, but if you access it at home, you've got to pay something like £12 a month. So I tend to go on days up to London. Um, and sit in the in the British Library. And if you are live in the vicinity of London, I know it's it's a very southern thing, and I wish there was another British Library up north. Mm -hmm. But if you do if you do live in London or around London, um, it's a wonderful place to write mm -hmm. and research. If you can get a if you can go at the get right a table. Time. If you can get a table, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, crazy busy all the time. Very it good Wi-Fi there, though, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, one of the reasons it's really busy is that UCL, apparently, I've heard UCL Library um, gets really packed and they have advised their students to use the British Library, which is a bit annoying. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> when was there ever a time when students weren't annoying? <laughs> <laughs> And in terms of of your reading, uh, and you know, you acknowledge many many books in uh, in in the back of the the book here as 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 resources. Were you sort of steeped in the Victorian world to start with, or is this something you've had to learn? And is it something you do before you write, or, or as you write, or after the first draft? Yeah, that's a good question. And and to all those people who are considering writing or thinking about writing historical fiction, um, I didn't know anything about the Victorian era when I started writing the first Arrowwood book. So don't, don't feel that you have to be an expert if you're gonna write in a particular historical period. When I did start writing, I very quickly did have to become an expert. So I read massive amounts um, about Victor. Luckily, there, there's great history books out mm. there, um, both academic books as well as popular for, for, for a more popular audience. Um, so I read, I read a massive amount, and every book, every Arrowwood book I write, 
I read a loads more. So for, for, for the first one, I was reading all about Victorian street life and poverty and the, the Irish question at the time and the politics um, and the, the bombing campaigns, the Fenians. Um, for this book, I read uh, about South African history in the Victorian period, which was really interesting, and the history of the Zulu nation, um, but also I had to read about Victorian racism and, you know, the racial sciences ideas of the time. But but I also kept reading more and more about, you know, the life of the poor, um, street life, street life in London. Um, and I have copious notes, notebooks full of the stuff. Um, but I'm reading all the way through each book. Uh, um, and I, I often, and this, I, th I find this really important is I don't, I don't, I'm not one of the writers who plan out the plots in advance. I start with an idea um, of a possible crime that could happen around a particular social issue of the day. Um, and then I think about my characters and I start writing a few chapters and all the way through that writing of that book, I'm reading history. And what often happens is that I find things in what are in the history that I want to put in the book. And that changes the nature of the characters and it changes the way the plot's going, you know, or changes the backstory of the characters halfway through the book, three quarters of the way through the book. Um, that really helps to me because it, it, I keep the writing fresh. It feels, it feels, it feels exciting for me because I'm, I'm injecting new ideas from outside all the time, which are changing what I thought I was doing. Um, and, you know, for me, that keeps my enthusiasm up and it makes me feel more and more creative, I think. When you come to a point where you come across some wonderful gem of, of, of information that will pivot your book, might change the nature of a character, do you keep writing that draft or are you, or are you tempted to go back and make changes and then catch up on yourself? Um, well, if it's something that, that needs some change earlier on, then I will go back and pepper pepper what I've written already with stuff that that allows that thing to to, to be added um, often you forget where you need to put it so therefore it's only when you come to reread the draft that you think oh I need to put something in, in there yeah so it works both ways I think excellent good stuff and I, I, I was going to ask what's coming next but I've seen that the the Arrowwood books have been optioned for TV with Kathy Burke as an executive producer uh, any any news on that anything you can tell us about that or is that something you're sort of stepping back and just letting them get on with it well I can tell you um they've been fantastic there's um Pippa who now works for Lookout Point and um Kathy Burke um they sort of put together a team and um the man who produced uh, who directed uh, Vanity Fair um, is on it, and David Eldridge, the playwright, is on it. Um, they invited me to all the script meetings, which is just amazing for a writer because I know that mm. often doesn't happen. Mm. Um, so I've I've had great experiences of sort of seeing how a script writer works and, and and the process by which people feed into that, and it keeps changing. It took two years um, to produce a final version of the first episode of the mm. script. <laughs> But now there's a package and it's being right. taken out by the production company to broadcasters. So um, there's a sort of, there's a package with the first script. Mm -hmm. So I hope, you know, it'd be fantastic if it did reach the screen, but, but um, I think a lot of books get taken to this stage and it's every stage is a big hurdle. Exactly. Yeah, it's very, very true. Well, good luck with that. Fingers crossed. Hope to see Arrowwood, Arrowwood on the screen soon. And are there more adventures Coming from uh, the streets of Victorian London, I hope so. It's um, it depends on contracts and sales for this book and so on. But I very much hope so. I want to. I'm writing. I'm writing a, a modern day crime book at the moment. But very much hope to get back to Arrowwood after that. Uh, well, folks, if you want to lose yourself in the main streets of Victorian London, Mick, four, all four of the Arrowwood books are, are out now. So go grab them. Mick, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's been absolutely brilliant. Hope to speak to you again thank soon. You. Thank you. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit 
bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Now, it's really interesting, isn't it, Mark, when we talk about how to hook a reader in and and how you can reference other characters in other books. And I think what Mick did, the thing that really jumped out for me was this idea of bringing Sherlock Holmes in as mm-hmm. a kind of, a, as a reference point. Mm. Very clever because instantly you're pulling in all of those Sherlock Holmes fans yeah. who then get curious about, well, who is this, you know, Arrowwood? Yeah. I mean, this this period uh, for historical fiction, for crime fiction, I mean, it's such a rich scene. London was so exciting and thrilling and so many interesting things were going on. And there's also this incredible dark side. And these are, you know, not long after Jack the Ripper as well. Um, but what absolutely fascinated me is that Mick knew nothing about the Victorian era before he started writing the first book, at, but he made himself an expert. And I think that's really inspirational. If you're someone who's thinking, I want to write a series set in ancient Egypt, but I don't know anything about it. Well, if you, you know, if you apply yourself, if you if you set a goal, if you say to yourself, right, I'm going to learn as much as I can about this, then I think I think what came out of, of talking to Mick was that he has great fun discovering Victorian London and the history behind it as he writes it. And that enthusiasm and passion comes across in his writing. Yeah. And the fact that you're learning it as you're discovering it as you're writing it means that you're fascinated. It's not something you like learned 20 years ago and you studied and you, but it's actually relevant. It's relevant to you. It's new to you. And you've got all this enthusiasm. It's a great way of doing it. One thing that really jumped out for me though, was when he's talked about the Victorian newspaper. I thought I've never seen a Victorian newspaper. How, where are you, where do you even go? To, like, like you pop down to my local library and say, can I have a, a Victorian newspaper from like uh, the 1700s? Like, there was, where do you go to get a paper like that? The, well, I mean, the British Library, as you said, is good for that. Uh, mm. And actually, if you you know if you book ahead, you can you can book these things out. And uh, and there are online resources as well, which you have to pay for online research resources. I guess where um, they're scanned. I guess I guess they're scanned in. Are they? They're, in they're scanned in. Yeah. yeah, and they're all cross referenced as well. So if you type in, so I mean, the the British Library is the certainly in the UK is the best resource for anything like this. And the fact that you can uh, tap in wherever you are in the world uh, to to research this is incredibly useful. But you know, like he said, it's probably easier if you're local to jump on a train and and go there yourself. Yeah, um, it's quite a it's, place, isn't it? I mean, the British Library. I mean, I'd, I'd recommend anyone who's never been there who can get there to just go and just be around the ambience yeah. of all those books. Because am I right in thinking that that is where? individual copies of each book are also stored now or does is that kind of going back um certainly there's a record a record of your book is is put there um so they will have a if it's got you know if it's been published and has an isbn then then it generally goes there but it's it's just it, it, one it's an incredible building um, oh yeah you know all these different levels and there are books everywhere but yeah and you can you know you can grab a table and and study or write and there's very good wi-fi there and and it's it's basically full of people with laptops heads down you know so it's um yeah. and there is there is a great vibe when you go through you feel like yeah i'm with the cool kids you know <laughs> well it's, it's that um, kind of i mean I, I lived in cambridge england for like 15 years and i must admit when i used to go walking around some of the little cobbled streets down the back of some of the old you know King's colleges and Churchill College and all these different places. There is a sense of connecting with ancestry and genius and the mm. you know all these. You th- I always used to think, wow, a Newton probably walked along this pathway at some point. You, yeah, yeah. you know, and 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 all these all these other luminaries that you that read about and learn about in history, and yet you think. And I said this, I think there's something amazing about actually going to a place and just being open to absorb. I mean, imagine if you could write by osmosis. I think that's why a lot of people like to go and sit in libraries. I certainly do. I like to sit around those incredible books. I feel more inspired to write yeah. Yeah, good you, stuff. You, um, you feel like you're part of something bigger. And there's a lot yeah. to be said for walking, you know, walking those streets and soaking up the atmosphere and going. This is why we love going to places for research. You know, it, mm. it really helps. So, um, but yeah, yeah. So speaking of old newspapers, little digression here. I want to share this because... Um, I've got one here. I've got a few actually, and uh, this is um, sad story behind this because one one of Claire's a gardener and one of her clients passed away, 
And um, her husband, who also has passed away, collects books and he collects old newspapers. And the family, you know, house full of books said, well, you know, we don't know what to do with the books. We were going to burn them. I said, what? So <laughs> we've, we've taken the books off them and, and we're sending a lot of them off, off to charity. Um, yeah. But I've kept the newspapers. And this is a copy of The Public Advertiser from April 1791. Whoa. Okay. So this is uh there's not a lot of news, but there's lots of public announcements and ads. And on the back page, I found an advert for a book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to read here because this is 18th century book marketing, and it just shows nothing has changed. Okay, so uh it starts. This day was published, price four pence or three shillings and sixpence per dozen to those who buy them to give away. So immediately <laughs> Genius. Okay, so you can buy a book for four pence, but if you give them away, you get them a little bit cheaper. If you if oh, you buy if you buy a dozen brilliant. and give them away, so already pyramid scheme. Okay, so. <laughs> the whole set. That's Amazon right there, isn't it? Yeah. The oh book is God. called. The book's title: Advice to Unmarried Women. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. Advice to unmarried women to recover and reclaim the fallen and to prevent the fall of others. Uh, into the snares and consequences of seduction. So this is this is clearly an important book. This is a lifestyle book on you know fallen women and unmarried women, how they could be you know fall into. So, and this was printed for J F and C Rivington, number sixty two, St Paul's Churchyard. Okay, so that's his new book. Same advert of who may be had by the same author. So this is by the same author. Okay, yeah. An inquiry into the design of the Christian Sabbath and the manner in which it should be observed to answer its important ends. That one's one shillings and sixpence. So you can Ooh, get that. And bargains. also gratis, a free book. Okay, you can also get a free book. Nothing has changed. Okay, also gratis, a list of religious books and tracts designed principally for the instruction and edification of the lower classes of people. What? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Well, that so, has changed ever so slightly, but my goodness me! I'm going to take a back photo of this. I'll put it all over my social oh, media if you want to find oh it. Oh my goodness! It. It's a, and it's one of these things as well because it's so old. All the all the s's look like f's. Um, oh yes! So yeah, this day was published. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I love this advice to unmarried women. So yes, that's um, oh my goodness, hasn't that's, changed at all. You've got you've got the free book as a as a teaser to get you in. You know, yeah. um, buy buy one get one free. Or whatever. <laughs> oh, I love it, absolutely love it. Yeah. So the, and the thing is, these things that, that you know, if you can get your hands on old newspapers, they are full of little slices of life which could inspire a much much bigger story. So mm. I mean, you know, Mick was talking about this extraordinary story of these guys from the Tal who, you know, it, it, the, the the whole story is just incredible it's based on a true story and obviously he's got a lot that he can dig down there. But if you're just looking for a little slice of life, a little something maybe to inspire a short story, these are just gold, absolute uh, gold. Brilliant. I mean, and also all of the really famous things that have happened probably all been taken and used in some way or other right but if you delve into something like that and you find um i mean it really touch it really connects you with the the, the mindset of somebody that was living in that time what yes. people were reading yeah. um the 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 discrimination <laughs> all the things that we now like gasp at when we hear but it kind of makes me think gosh what will be people thinking about the things that we're putting out you know, today, yeah. say three <laughs> three hundred years from now, right? But um, I think it's I think it's really important to um, connect, especially if you're a, a writing anything historical fiction or time travel. You know, going back in time, um, it's really important just to kind of connect with that because it just kind of gets you in the mindset of how people wrote, what people were writing about, how people lived, and mm -hmm. it can trigger. I mean, even just you know the lower classes that it triggers a whole kind of world in some ways of what was going on in that time yeah i just love it that's absolutely fascinating one thing talking to newspapers actually just as a quick aside um my daughter turned 19 and in canada that is the kind of adult official adult age at least in the west coast of canada they decide different ages all over the place but it's how do they de determine what is the legal adult age it's actually usually the drinking age <laughs> it yeah, seems yeah, to be the big yeah. thing that the kids all think is really important but um but for her birthday i pulled out a copy of the times 
from the day she was born. Right. Um, and it was really interesting. I mean, we're only going back 19 years. I mean, we've just like gone back in time in the time machine and that. But um, for anyone who is pregnant, uh, for any family that are thinking of having kids, make sure that you buy copies of the newspaper on the day they were born because it was such a brilliant gift. She was overwhelmed when she saw mm. it to just to see what was happening on the day that she came into the world. Um, but then they were flicking through, she was flicking through the kind of, it was the time, it was Saturday. So she had all the different sections as well. Oh, really? Um, Kept all yeah, those too. Which Brilliant. was great. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, the whole thing, like even the, even the TV guide is still in the <laughs> killing film. So she could see what was, what was on TV the day she was born. Brilliant. In fact, what was on TV the moment she was born, what rerun was happening at 3.30 <laughs> in the morning on ITV. But, um, <laughs> What was interesting is there was a section in there called Encounters. There was a whole page called Encounters. And she was like, oh my gosh. She goes, this is like, this is like what they did before online dating apps. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. actually, you're totally right. And even in like 20 years to see how much has changed and to see, you know, these, these encounters, as they call them, which were, you know, pr pr you know, the precursor to online dating apps. It was fascinating. And, but it gave, it blew her mind. Like, you know, oh my gosh, this is what people were doing when I was, when I was just coming into this world. So mm -hmm. yeah, just a big tip for parents, make a note to, to, cause on the day when it's insane and everything's kind of, you know, there's labor and like, it's probably the last thing you remember to do or get somebody else just to go. I actually picked up uh, every copy of every paper. My daughter. Of course you did. I, I, of course you did. <laughs> well, but, but what's interesting is I looked at the sun and I thought, I can't give her that. On no, the, like, no. I'm going <laughs> to. And the trouble is, is, on the day she was born, all the headlines, and this was the downs, this is the downside about buying newspapers. There was some big murder that had happened and it was like every front page was like yeah. blah, 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 murder death blah, killing and i just thought oh actually that's not so good because you know you're born into but then that is you know part of the reality of media um yeah. but it's also yeah. kind of interesting to kind of you know as she turns into an adult to to, to see the realities of you know the world that, that she came into as well you know in some parts of you know society and i, I always think the media tend to kind of we always read the bad stuff in the press. Like it's, it's today's bad news. Oh, and, yeah. and then we yeah. look at the world and think the world's a horrible place. Whereas actually we're just looking at the very worst of the worst things that have happened in the world on that. I'm, I'm listening to an audio book at the moment called Humankind by Rutger Bregman, who did mm. a, another book called Utopia for Realists. And his argument is actually things are pretty good. Things are actually going in the right direction. It's just we only hear the bad stuff and yeah, we always assume the worst of people. Yeah. But actually, humanity, you know, we're facing a big challenge with climate change, but people are working really hard on that, actually. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 if you're ever feeling down, humankind, Rutger Bregman, highly recommend it because, awesome. you know, <laughs> we, we are, we are amazing people. We can do absolutely amazing yeah. things. I know if you sit there watching rolling 24 hour news, it might not feel like it, but actually yeah. take a step back, take a wee break from that and see how much happier you might be. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Um, another thing that I found really fascinating, I mean, we've not really even dived into the kind of the psychology, psychology side of things. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I mean, I love psychology. It's something that I, I've studied since I was like 16 and I, I read books on it for fun. Um, but it's interesting how Mick was, you know, connecting it to the value of, of, of learning about when you're an author, because really you're writing about human behavior, you're writing about emotion. I mean, we know we've always said that's the most essential thing when you're writing character it's like really getting into the emotion of that character and portraying that emotion to the reader but the psychology element's just mind-blowingly fascinating and deep isn't it i think if you want to be a writer if you want to write about human beings and the human experience you have to have an, uh, an interest in how the human mind works and why we make the decisions that we do and getting a good grounding i've read you know, I've not studied it, but I've read a few basic books in it. And any book, any non-fiction book that goes into the psychology of the human condition, like the Rutger Bregman, Bregman book, that's 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 catnip to me. I love stuff like that. Um, I remember my daughter studied uh, criminal psychology as an AS level, so she did it for a year, and 
gosh, she, we had great conversations about that, about the, you know, the, the terrible things humans do to each other and why they do it. Um, yeah, it, anything like that. Just, I'm not saying go off and do a three year degree, but get a good grounding and just think about it and have a fascination in it and, and an interest in it. Uh, and it will just help you with your writing because so much of, of what good writing is about is human motivation, hum- why we desire things, goals that we want, and the things that stand in our way and the things that we're willing to do to achieve those goals. That's the human condition. That's that's what we get up and and, and live for every single day. Mm. And sometimes run on autopilot and habits <laughs> and all the other things that we do. I mean, uh, on many levels, I think there's a double benefit here for writers. The first thing is obviously getting into the mind of your character, but also understanding the minds of your readers. That's the thing that we don't often talk about, but to understand those two things and how they connect is super important. But also on top of all that, it's really, it's really valuable to study psychology on and take a general interest, an ongoing interest in it because it helps you. It helps you understand yourself. It understands you what the motivations you've got for writing your book, um, the motivations as to why you want to write s- specific things in your book because things that are important to you. But also from the personal growth side of things, like I, I've obviously been a big advocate of um, personal growth and um, personal development over the years. And the reason why I got into psychology almost unknowingly was because I took an interest in personal development books. And that is, it's all psychology on one level or another. And learn Learning about yourself and becoming self-aware about why you do the things you do. It's like in some ways getting the blueprints of really, you know, understanding what motivates you, understanding but what why you do the things you do, but more importantly, thinking about what you actually want to do moving forward. It's about getting in touch with your life. And it's about thinking about your life on a grander scale and saying, what does this mean? You know, what does this valuable time that I have on this planet mean to me? And what should I be, what should I be doing? How should I best be spending that? And if I'm going to spend time writing about it, which we know is a huge chunk, then how am I going to use that time in a really effective, valuable way beyond just quotes writing a story? Because, you know, we've, we've talked about all the themes and the important messages that we want to try and portray in books to readers. You know, there's more than just a story there, folks. There's more than just a, a bit of entertainment. There's always something that you can take away that might change someone's life in some ways. It might like make them look at the world differently. It might make you look at the world differently. And, and that's the bit that we don't often talk about. And I think bringing the psychology element in starts to open that world to us in an incredible way. Yeah. It's, you know, I've said this before, writing is trying to solve the puzzle that can never be solved, which is the human condition. But to have a healthy fascination in that can only make you a, a better person, which is why I love hanging out with writers and talking to writers because we're all trying to make sense of who we are. Um, it's that thing of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, trying to see the world through a different perspective. These are good, healthy things to do, which is why when you think you're, why am I doing this? What's the point of this? I'm struggling with the muddy middle. I can't think of an ending. But the fact is your writing is making the world a better place in its own little way. So um, keep at it, I yeah, say. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Portobello Road, <laughs> that's a, for people outside of the UK, I mean, a lot of people know about Portobello Road and the market. But for people outside the UK that have never heard of that, how would you give it give them the kind of like the the twitter version overview well all all life is in the portobello road i mean th- there's a song in bed knobs and broomsticks to be fair portobello road uh, there's a whole song about it um but yeah it's uh, i mean my uncle desmond had a a barrow in the E Street Market in Woolworth, and they're so quite similar marks. It's starting to sound like an episode of Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a little bit of that, and also Obla Di Obla Da, Desmond and the Barrow in the Marketplace. Um, his life was very different, though. But <laughs> but yeah, all life is there, and you see you see people who um, you know these markets often very working class markets where people are looking for bargains and looking for deals. You're constantly haggling. And then you've got a criminal element there, as you said, people trying to pass off dud checks. Uh, you know, this is, you talk about psychology, blimey, there's your degree right there, you know? And I've done, I've not done market sales. I've done boot sales and stuff like that. And whenever I've done a, a boot sale, I, I'm just, I, I'm kicking myself for not taking a notebook because there's so much, oh, I know. so much material. You know? I have to stop you there as well, because in the US and in Canada, 
they have never, or most people have never heard of a boot sale or a car boot sale, as we call it in England. Uh, the equivalent folks for all of my Canadian and American friends over here is the garage, the garage sale, yeah, the garage the yard, sale. The yard sale. The yard yeah, sale, yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. in England, we have this really brilliant tradition and I love it and I miss it. I miss it. I used to go to car boot fairs all the time. I, yeah. oh, it was a treasure trove. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would come home bargains. with so much yeah. junk. <laughs> brilliant but i would find it was amazing but they, just to let people know what this thing is because i've, I've had to explain this to people in canada They're like oh this is weird and it's like and it's funny when you have to then explain it to someone who's never heard of it it's like imagine the world's largest field on a sunday morning and and people congregate in the mist through the mist these cars arrive yes. and then people pull out of the back of their cars their boots as we call them in you know the trunk, trunk. is what the boot is okay folks yeah. we, tra we had a translation uh, section a glossary in our back to reality back to book reality, because yeah, yeah. of these things <laughs> um, we've actually got a glossary so if you haven't read the book go and have a look at it it's brilliant um mark had to trawl through our entire book and like translate everything but um they pull out a foldable table. This is now advanced booting, a foldable table from the back of the boot. And they, they set it up in their designated space. And yeah. you imagine all these cars in a row, um, usually stuck in the field. That's the bit that no one talks about. You know, winter's day, you get stuck in a muddy field. And then they start putting all their trinkets out on their, on their, um, table. So it's not really out the car boot, but it comes out the car boot on the table. And then just thousands, literally thousands of people show up. Yeah. I went to one in North of Ely in Cambridgeshire, and I think they got about 8,000 people per sale. And they were yeah. probably about 600 cars. And you would literally just walk along and you kind of peer and you, people would be rifling through your, you know, your stuff. And, and then the haggle. Like it's like a Turkish market on steroids, right? It's like 50p for that. You must be mad. You must be mad. <laughs> Me with a poor dying mother. What? I mean, we, we did we did a few when the kids had grown out of stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, and it is that thing. It's usually, in, you know, a frosty autumn. They, they come yeah. out the mist like zombies. And uh, you have Hung to be over. so careful because um, they will start pour. You, you'll be unloading and they yeah, start yeah, yeah. pouring. It's like kick. Get off! Get, get off! Your and hands open off. You. And and we, I think we still had a child booster seat. You know, mm. I left the door open. And they're going, oh, how much is that? Get <laughs> away! Get away! My daughter turned up on a bicycle halfway through the day and leaned it up against the car, and they were going, oh, that's a nice bike. And like, no, get off! It's not for sale. So, oh, everything's for sale. The little girl, how much for her? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so don't leave your kids. Don't leave your kids so, wandering around. But no, if, it's if you're after if you're after a VHS collection of Buffy the Vampire. Empire, so <laughs> these are the place to go. Yeah. It's like every well, other stall has a collection, a VHS collection of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which no one wants anymore, but it's all there. It, it's it's <laughs> like a petri dish of British culture. It it's really absolutely is. Absolutely brilliant. My daughter once decided she was gonna get into beanie babies. Mm. And we used to, I would say to her, and it's all tactics. That's like she said, Daddy, Daddy, I found a, she's eight years old, right? So she's saying, not not now, but when she was eight, she was like, Daddy, Daddy, there's this woman selling look her entire a collection of beanie babies and she's hardly sold any i said right right daughter what you need to do is wait two minutes before the market closes go back to her and then make her an offer for the lot and yeah. he, she said oh but. so so we went back over there and there was this woman like living very depressed with her in massive avalanche of beanie babies that she collected religiously they had the tags on the ears and everything yeah. and i thought oh, there's probably some collectibles in here but she was obviously like it was that she was in her 40s she's like i'm letting go this is i have to move on <laughs> And and I, honestly, my daughter made an offer and she looked into her eyes and she thought, oh, well, they're going to a good ho home. But she was literally, I felt so sorry for her. She was almost in tears, this woman, because she was letting go of her, literally her childhood. Yeah. And and it was just like heartbreaking. So there's all these emotional experiences you, you get at car boot fairs as well, yeah. which is just bonkers. There's a, there's a famous photo of a divorced couple in a courtroom who have been ordered by a judge to split their beanie babies. They're on, they're on their <laughs> knees with a suitcase and going, mm, you can have that one. And you can and the judge no apparently worries. this was the big breaking point in the in the divorce thing. Anyway, oh. we digress. I mean, talk about human psychology. Oh, well, yeah. we, we digress, but it's yeah. also yeah. blooming brilliant. I love it. So here's another tip. Um, mm -hmm. if you're planning a trip to London anytime soon, British uh the, the British Library and yeah. go to a car like, booth. A car boot sale. <laughs> Or a market. I mean, the thing, thing market, with the market yeah. is you'll see all the kind of life there. A boot sale is interesting because, as you say, it's like 
people are putting themselves on display. Yeah, you'll see it's the, okay, in attics of everyone's that, lives. That's their record collections. That those are their books. These are the this is the tat that they were were given that they're now giving away. So yeah. it is. Um, yeah, go with a notebook. Oh, don't buy, don't buy anything. Don't take any oh, money. Oh, no, no, no. Because well, if, you, if you're traveling, <laughs> yeah, if you're traveling, you'll end up paying 10 times as much as it's worth in suitcases to get it home. <laughs> I could never, ever go to a boot fair without coming back with an absolute. I think that's why it's called boot fair, because I would come back with a bootload of junk. Yeah. But um, I must admit, over the years, I've found some absolute treasures. And I, I still have friends that go out the religiously, like every Saturday and Sunday morning. And they, they it's just. It's just brilliant. I love it. But anyway, yeah. um, but psychology, it's all happening there, folks. So do, if you want to do some research and uh, if you've ever been to a boot fair for, and you're not from the UK, tell us what your experience was like. I really want to hear. I mean, we're going to get all kinds of stories coming out of the woodwork. But also, what's the best book you've ever found at a car boot fair? That's the other thing. I mean, you could find collections. Like I heard of someone that found the original Strand magazines there, which were right. yeah, that's Sherlock it, yeah. Holmes, the original yeah. published Sherlock Holmes books, you wow. know, chatting. So, you know, you just never quite know what you're going to find because some people just want to get rid of their stuff. And, you know, it's not like um, Antique Roadshow where people are valuing, you know, mm. some old heirloom from from families of, of uh, you know, ancestral generations. These are sometimes people who just want to get rid of stuff. And in a box of tat, you might find something that's worth thousands and uh, of some value. And you, yeah, anyway, check it out. Car boot fairs all over the UK happening now. <laughs> 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 Brilliant, Mark. Well, let's dive into social media. There's been a lot of great wins this week, haven't there? Oh, just wonderful stuff, both on the Academy and the Best Seller Experiment Group. And there's quite a few, so I'm going to whiz through these, but there's some great stuff. Over on the Best uh, Seller Academy, uh, we've got uh, – this is great. Chris Everhart uh, shot a short horror film called Stay Away, and uh, it's now going to premiere a film competition at Halloween. Chris Fantastic. You sh wrote and shot a, a horror Wrote and just shot, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. A um, couple of wins from Jack Carmen. She finished a third draft of her book, Nobody Knows Jack, and uh, sort of so it's two days before her original deadline, which is absolutely brilliant. And she says she's now got to go through and check all, all my idioms and colloquialisms. Well, I'll tell you what, Jack, I love a good idiom and colloquialism, so don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, also, Jack also had a short story, In Tempest and the Night of Nightingales, published this week by the Selkie. And, uh, you know, so that's an absolute win. This is great because the Academy... We're nearly a year old now, and we're, people are finishing their books. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, note from Samantha Makuza, uh, who uh, she set herself a goal of 75,000 words. She's she's written the first draft of a book, Hunting Her, just shy of 80,000 words, actually, but she's got to go in and make some edits. But that is absolutely brilliant, and she's going to be celebrating that. Um, this is a great one, Chris Lowenstein, uh, who is, you know, she's in the academy, she's a teacher, been a very, very difficult time for teachers uh, recently. And, you know, she shared with us the details of the ups and downs of, of writing this. But she said, what I want to also add is that although I've not finished my draft without the Academy, I would have quit this project altogether. For me, it's a win to have kept going. Total word count since last August when she, when she joined, 48,000 words. She says that's 48,000 more words than I would have written if I'd not signed up for the Academy. So thank you uh, to Mark and Mark and the Academy for helping me to adjust to setbacks and keep persevering absolutely brilliant and i read that post and i was just it just it warms my heart to, to hear those things because actually that is one of the things that's one of the reasons why we're here on the podcast in the academy is to is to help people keep going because writing is a really it can be really hard when it when when time's tough when there's ups and downs it's very easy to let go of the writing but what we're trying to be here is like a constant companion, if you like, a constant support. Always there waiting, ready for when that inspiration hits. So absolute massive congratulations, Chris. That is such a huge, huge win. Um, and to hear, you know, the the the, the benefits of what, what's happening is just brilliant. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. So, someone who, who won't let go of the words is Mr. Mark Hood, who we've mentioned on here many times before. He's just hit 600 days of writing every day in a row. That totals nearly 360,000 words in that time. And Mark says, and some of them are even good. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely mind blowing. I mean, we were blown, I think, when blown away when Mark said that he'd hit 100, then 200, yeah. then, then hit the year. 
hit the consecutive, like the 365 days, 600 days. I've actually now said to him, I've challenged Mark. I said, okay, I said, you're now closer to a thousand days than you are to when you started. So that's the challenge I've, I've laid the gauntlet down for Mark. Can you do a thousand days of consecutive writing? That's, that's three and a bit years. Utterly brilliant. Well done, Mark. Absolutely mind blowing. And do you know what else we've got on the uh, on the uh, academy? We've got uh, an award nominee, Osman Hanif. Osman says my novel, Blasphemy: The Trial of Dinesh Masi, was shortlisted for the PFC VOW Book Award in India. He said, "I'm not eligible for most awards in India because I'm not a citizen." So this is very exciting. I went and had a look. The cover for Osman's book, Blasphemy, and it's on Amazon, folks. Go and check it out. Osman Hanif, Blasphemy, The Trial of Dinesh Masi. Gorgeous cover. Absolutely gorgeous. And so got everything crossed for you, Osman. Wishing you every luck with that. That just um, just looks amazing. And I believe in the uh, we were having a conversation, and I believe he's still looking for a UK publisher for this. So publishers, you're always talking about wanting to uh, have a more diverse list of authors. Check out Blasphemy by Osman Hanif. Pull your finger out. Get to it. Absolutely. Uh- <laughs> Osman's amazing. He's such a leading, like such a light in the academy as well. Such it's brilliant work. So well done. And congratulations. And fingers crossed for the competition as well. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, really, really, really hope that's a success. We're, uh, over on the BXP group on Facebook, Mel Melsa, um, who is brilliant science fiction author that I know, she says, got to share this as I'm really proud of my story in the latest issue of Clark's World magazine. Now, in the science fiction fantasy world, Clark's World magazine is, is she's in issue 178. It's a monthly magazine. Uh, it's where so many science fiction authors get their start. Uh, mm. So this is huge for Mel and huge congratulations on, on getting your story into Clark's Clark's World magazine. That is a really, really big deal. That's and, brilliant, Mel. And finally, uh, a little note from Julian Barr, our friend Julian Barr, who's been on the podcast a few times and uh, the guy I go to when I want my short stories edited. He's just, just amazing. Uh, Julian says, just want to give a shout out to the bestseller experiment 200 word a day challenge. Writing a minimum 200 words a day helped me build up momentum like I've never had before. I'm on day 216 of a writing streak and now consistently producing about 10,000 words per week. Now, Julian, he's been published. He's uh, been published uh, independently and published by publishers in Australia. He's a fantastic writer. Um, but the fact that we've got, it's not just about people starting out. It's And it worked for me and it worked for Julian and it's working for all kinds of authors. Just this 200 word a day approach is really, really working. Brilliant. So if you want to try that out, folks, uh, you simply go to 200wordchallenge.com and find out what the magic is all about. Just get started. It's completely free. Just go in there and read up about it, sign up and start banking your words with us. We are approaching soon uh, 20 million words banked in the word bank. So please get involved and tell a friend and you know what if you need a bit more accountability get a friend to do it with you get a friend to start with you that works brilliantly as well so but congratulations julian we're actually going to have to start um you realize mark we are going to have to start some kind of like you know uh word challenge all stars uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) because we've i know that we've got mark at 600 julian at 200 plus i know that we've got adam jarvis in the academy who's recently passed 250 i believe wow and a lot of other people who probably haven't even told us where they're at so uh, if you want to join those luminaries and um and get involved it's just a bit you know it's it's fun as well and it's a personal challenge and it's not about comparing people with people but it's a personal challenge to see what you're capable of doing just this week so go for it folks 200 word challenge.com excellent stuff mr stay well it has been a wonderful wonderful podcast i want to thank our guest mick finley for coming on the show and enlightening us with their his psychology insights mm. um and also thank you to all of you that have written into us thank you to everyone who is absolutely rocking it in their writing we actually hit over a hundred wins just this week in the academy which was one of my personal goals for the academy Mm. and that was a massive milestone so congratulations to everyone who's posting their wins there and just keep going folks this is like writing is life life is writing right it's not something that um comes easy to uh, most of us um there's highs and lows but the most important thing is is just to write right right and things good things always happen to those who keep on going so thanks so much everyone joining us mr stay have a great week we'll be looking forward to more of this next week and 
it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye. Goodbye. And actually, Mark, we should probably say to people how they can get hold of us on social media. <laughs> well, I did wonder when you were going to get round to that, but I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> I knew there was something I forgot. Uh, Facebook, <clears throat> we're Bestseller Experiment. Twitter and Instagram, we're at Bestseller XP. A please subscribe, rate and review on your podcast catcher of choice. And thank you, as always, to our editors, Dave and JD, who will be going, hang on, they've done this bit in the wrong order. And thank you to anyone who stayed with us this long. Another <laughs> long episode, another epic journey. <laughs> So, Mr. Stay, I think our time's done here, mate. We better, we better, yeah, we better make yeah, a quick exit. Everyone, yeah. All right. Cheers, mate. See you next week. Bye. Ta-ra. Ta-ra.